to my raptured soul. There's coming a rapture one of these days, and we're moving on out of here, finding rest and peace beyond the river. That's a good way to start this morning. It's good to see you. It's good to be in the Lord's house. Uh, praise the Lord for a good week of Bible school, what uh, seeds have been sown, and what what hearts have been touched this week, we don't really know for sure. But we hold, know that God holds it all in his hands, and we're just trusting him. And I, I don't want to quit praying. Do you? Something that those little kids learned this week, or something that they saw, something that would touch their heart, something that would bring them closer to knowing about Jesus and knowing about a uh, personal relationship with him. Let's build on that. Let's let's ask the Lord to build on that and and do those things that would follow up and and bring uh, the watering and the, the the all the things that's needed and just the, the pray amen to the Lord's house and the Lord's family. And First Thessalonians chapter one is where I'm at this morning and this. Some interesting things going on this week, of course, and, and uh, things at work, things at Bible school, things uh, at home, and uh, just something I wanted to share with you. But first of all, I want to read chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians uh, 1 through 5. It says, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy... Unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from, our, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye knowing what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And may I say, it's important to know who we are, isn't it? Uh, the funny thing I wanted to share with you this morning is... Uh, we got the call uh, one day this week. I don't remember what day exactly it was. Um, one of our good neighbors had a, a water leak and, and they needed a little bit of help. And uh, so me and Brian went. Brian happened to be, I guess it was Friday because he's not off uh, much any other time. But we rolled up over there and looked at the pipe and, and Brian, they wanted to dig it out on the other outside of the house a little bit to see what going on there and so Brian went home we went home back to the shop and Brian was going to get the tractor the backhoe and I drove the truck back well I drove back in the yard and and before I even got the door open hardly I heard hey hey I thought who's that and I know there's one they've got seven kids and the whites and the the next to the youngest is two years old, and, and uh, he's very outspoken. He'll call you out. I, bl I believe he called Petey out one day over there at uh, uh, a meeting. But anyway, I said, hey. He said, are you with Brian? <laughs> two years old now. And I said, yeah, Brian's on his way with the digger. He said, but are you with Brian? I said, yeah, I'm with Brian. And either he thought just a minute, he'd already been told that Brian and JP were coming over. Or maybe one of his older sister or brother said, that's JP, I'm not sure which. But a little bit later he said, are you JP? He was back here at the house and I flew him up the truck. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm JP. So he wanted to know who I was rolling up in his yard. He didn't, he didn't like mysteries. He don't like people being in his yard. ain't supposed to be in his yard. But as I read this and I thought about our identity, if I told him the wrong answer, he's going to go get mom and daddy, you know. 
and rightly so, rightly so. But Paul said here, he said, under the church of the, of the Thessalonians, and he came on down and he said, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. He's talking about who they are now. And labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, your calling. That's who they are, isn't it? Brethren. Fellow workers in the, in the faith. So many times we roll up somewhere and we don't know exactly who we are. We've got our head down and we just, you know, mumbling around and saying, well, uh, you know, we're here from the church or we'd like to help or, or whatever. Or maybe we even show up at church and we don't hardly know who we are. We, Lord, bless me if you can or, or something like that kind of, you know, I, I finally made it here. So I, I'm just going to go through the motions. I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. We need to know who we are. We are the elect of God because he chose us in love and in mercy in Jesus Christ, his son. He said, go save my people. And he chose me. I don't know why. He chose you out of love. When I was unlovely, and I'm still unlovely, just to be honest, just ask my wife sometimes how unlovely I can be. But he still loves us, and he's put his name on us, and we bear his name. I mean, that's a responsibility. We need to act like we're his. But I thought about as, as Shepherd was calling me out and saying, who are you, and, and uh, are you with Brian? He, you know, I thought about that. You know, the, the uh, demons uh, told those that were trying to cast him out in Paul's name. And, or he said, Paul, I know, and Jesus, I know, but who are you? So he's saying, you, you with Brian? He knows Brian pretty good, I think. So our identity, who are we in Christ? I thought about some other things. As we go about our business here at church, we see each other coming in and going out, and we see our, our faithfulness or our lack of faithfulness, and, and we think, you know, sometimes even people we, we know pretty good and on all our life, we wonder how much their commitment is and we wonder about their home life or we wonder about their work life and we wonder about what kind of life they're living. But you know what? That's not our territory, is it? Their identity is between them and the Lord and their identity is wrapped up in Christ just as ours is. And he said in verse 5 there a very important thing. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. Uh, when the gospel gets involved and somebody's living the gospel, that you can tell they've been reading the Bible and you can tell they've been praying to the Lord and you can tell that they've been maybe witnessing to somebody or helping somebody along that needs some help. Then you begin to learn their identity. Uh, you learn a whole lot about people that you work beside of. I mean, you can go to church with them all your life, and you don't know them that well, but you get in there and you work beside of them. You begin to see whether they pull their weight or not, whether they say what they mean and mean what they say. You learn their identity. And you'll learn something about yourself in work, won't you? When, life, or when work comes flying at you and they dump this on your table and say, we need to get this done, or they dump it on your truck or whatever it is, and we need to, you to deal with this today, and you need to get it done, and we got a, a deadline, and we got this, and we got that, and you learn something about yourself. You learn your identity. You learn whether you're going to step up or you're going to run away. And we learn our identity in the Lord as the work. We learn about the work. We learn about the, the fields are white in the harvest, and we, we, we have a call. We have a... Uh, opportunity to work and to step up. Are we going to do that? Or are we going to run away? Are we going to stay in our comfort zone? That's me lots of times. I, I like to stay where it's comfortable. I didn't. I wasn't there yesterday. We went over to Sims Barbecue, and they ain't found out about air conditioning yet. <laughs> and uh, that wasn't my comfort zone. We about melted over there. But our identity in Jesus Christ is strong and it's sure, and we need to know what that is. 
and we need to claim it, not claim it as far as claiming wealth and riches and all that, but claim the name of Jesus Christ, that he is precious to our soul, that he has come and he's made his abode in our heart and our life, and people can see that in me and you, and we are a unified front as a church, as a body of Christ, showing love, compassion, and a witness. Well, the title of our lesson is Praying for Our Nation. So I'm going to ask you a question here. You know, reading this title for our lesson, who do you think of? Kurt. I think of Kurt. Because every Sunday that uh, he's here for the past so many years, most of the time, you know, he says, we need to pray for our, our country. You know, most Americans including myself, we're spoiled. We don't realize what it's like to live outside of this great country. You know, when a person has something, they usually take it for granted. But if you lose it, that's when you actually realize, you know, how much you miss it or how important it was. You know, Kurt, he, he knows firsthand you know, he's from Germany, and I, I think, I'm not sure on this, but I think he came here to the United States in, in, when he was in his 20s, if I'm not mistaken. By the way, he did come the right way without breaking the law. <laughs> but some people may deny that America was founded on God. Some people deny that. But our forefathers, they would pray. And they, they put their trust in God when they were forming the laws and, of this great land that we live in. By putting our trust in God, God blessed. He blessed our country and made it into a world leader. You know, we're very, very fortunate to live in America. And we do need to pray. We need to pray for our country every day because America is not like it what it used to be. We've changed, and it's not for the better. You know, people are more concerned about their abilities to kill babies than they are to feed the poor. You know, many people have made their God climate change. You know, climate change is all, is all they think about, and, and there is not one thing they can be able to do about it. You know, people put their trust and faith in the government or their political party instead of putting their faith and trust in God. You know, I've said it before, you know, man will fail you. And it's not always intentional. You know, I, I can, in good faith, tell you that I'm gonna, I'll meet you at the store tomorrow. But I get busy in my orchard and... And forget about our meeting. You stand around waiting and waiting, and I never show up. I failed you. But there is one that will never fail you. Now, we can put our whole trust, our whole faith in him because he is faithful and he is trustworthy. You know, Jesus Christ will always be there with us. Always. You know, it's a song that we sing sometimes, what a friend we have in Jesus. You know, it's Jesus, he's the best friend that anyone could ever have. So when we pray for our nation, why is it so important, like for Kurt, to say we need to pray for our nation? It's because our nation has fallen away from God. You know, our current administration is not big on supporting Israel. You know, it seems like they're more concerned about the Palestinians than they are Israel. You know, people in our country, it, it's a small percentage of people that go to church now and worship God. 
And then there again, a lot of our churches are not preaching the true Word of God now. Instead, they preach to meet their own agenda. You know, I, I, could, I could go on and on and on and probably spend the whole time this morning on the ways our country is falling or failing. But God has blessed us over the years. As I said earlier, we can put all of our trust in God. But, you know, looking back in history, anytime people turn back, they turn back to God. God promises has not changed. If our country will turn back to God, he's going to bless us. Now, if we elect a new president this fall, he will. He, he may be able to make things a little bit better. But he's not going to be able to solve all of our problems. Only Jesus can do that. As we talked about last Sunday, there are conditions for God to act on our behalf. We're to humble ourselves before God in, in repentance and submit to him. That's when our country will be great again. Our lesson is taken from 2 Chronicles. And Solomon, he had built the temple there in Jerusalem as, as God had promised David that it would be built. All of Israel had come together to dedicate the temple. Solomon, he had prayed. And this is where our lesson starts today. So here in verse 1. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying... The fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering in, in the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Solomon, he reigned as king for about 40 years, and it took him 20 years to have the temple and also his uh, palace uh, built. Solomon, he prayed to de dedicate the temple to God, but also he, during his prayer, he also interceded on the behalf of the people. Solomon knew that they had, the people had a tendency to sin and turn their back on God. It sounds a little bit like America. They made a sacrifice of sheep and oxen, and it says fire came down from heaven and it consumed the burnt offering. This indicated that God had accepted Solomon's prayer in the temple because God, he filled the temple with his presence. It says the glory of the Lord filled the house. This showed the people that the temple that Solomon had, was, had built was now the chosen place to pray, to worship, and to offer sacrifices. In verse 2, And the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. The priests were from the tribe of Levi, and each one of them were, were assigned duties inside the temple. But they couldn't go to perform their duties because of the glory of God was in the temple. God's presence, His power, and His glory, it was too much. It was just too much for them to enter into the temple. You know, the thing about it is we can't even imagine the greatness of God's power. We can't even imagine it. You know, America and other countries, they have nuclear weapons, which is very powerful and can destroy a, a city. But that power is absolutely nothing compared to God's power. You know, the temple here is called Solomon's Temple because he had built it. But actually, it was the Lord's temple where he chose to live among his people. You know, today, God doesn't live in a building. All that's accepted Jesus is their Lord and Savior. He lives within us. We are now God's temple. In verse 3, and when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. 
You know, God gives a warning to the Israelites what would happen if they were not obedient or would honor the covenant between them and God. First, I'm on the wrong verse on my notes. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry about that. You know, when the people saw that the glory of the Lord had filled the temple, they bowed down. They bowed down to their knees and they worshiped and they praised God. You know, they humbled themselves when they praised God. Just, just think about this. If we, had, if we had offered up a sacrifice to God and then all of a sudden fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, I bet we just wouldn't stand around and say, man, did you see that? I would say our knees would be hitting the ground and worshiping our Lord. We don't have to offer sacrifices to God anymore because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for each one of us. By knowing this, though, our knees should hit the floor thanking God and worshiping Him just like the Israelites had done. God is good, and His mercy endureth forever. You know, God's mercy, faithfulness, kindness, and goodness last forever. That's the reason. That's the reason we can always put our trust and our faith in God. His love is everlasting. Even when we mess up. All He wants for us to do is just come back to Him when we mess up. In verse 12, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night, and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer, and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. So the Lord appeared to Solomon and told Solomon that, hey, I've heard your prayers. Not only did God hear his prayers, God was going to grant Solomon's request. Now one thing that we can be sure of as we read us talking earlier about answered prayers, God will hear our prayers and will answer our prayers as He sees best, not as we see. May not be exactly what we want, but there again, God knows a lot better than we do. God also tells Solomon He approves the temple that He had built. God would dwell there among his people. In verse 13, if I shut up heaven, that there will be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. So this is what I said just a minute ago. Here God's given a warning to the Israelites what would happen if they were not obedient or would honor the covenant. First, there would be no rain. <clears throat> you know, they wouldn't be able to grow crops without God sending them rain. Then God says he would send locusts, which, we know, which also is known as a grasshopper, a type of grasshopper. You know, I never will forget, back in the early 80s, uh, my dad and I, and we, we planted about five acres, five and more acres of uh, apples, Trees on a hill. They, they were just little small trees. Locusts came. And you could actually see the line where the locust was eating the grass. Each hour, you could see that line had moved. Dead grass. They were moving forward. Locusts will destroy a plant life. So the Israelites, they would not be able to grow anything even if they had water to water it themselves. God then says he, sent, he will send pestilence, which is a deadly disease. People would die because of their disobedience. God is serious. He is serious when it comes to making a covenant with his people. 
today, a lot of people do not take this very seriously. Marriage. <coughs> Marriage is a covenant between a husband, wife, and God. But people don't take, take it seriously anymore. You know, people get married, don't work out. I'll just go get married again. If that doesn't work out, marry another. We need to remember, God takes a covenant between him and his people seriously, and so should we. In verse 14, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I'm trying to hurry. You know, the Israelites were God's chosen people. And the way they acted, what it was, is that reflected back upon God. So God would bless them, when them, but also he would correct them if they did wrong. So God says if they would humble themselves and pray and seek his face, you know, and they needed to realize, the people needed to realize that they were sinners just like we are today. Their response should be to fall down before God with humility and repent. Turn away from their sinful actions and turn toward God. God says if they will do this, then they will hear or he'll hear from heaven. He says that he will forgive them, forgive them of all their sins. He would also, he would bless them by healing their new land that God had given them. You know, I saw a sign on Facebook this week that said, instead, instead of saying Trump for 2024, or Biden for 2024, the sign said, Jesus for 2024. That's what our country needs most of all. You know, God desires, he desires to bless our country. But our country needs to repent and turn back to him. You know, there's some good news here I want to bring out. I always like to bring out some good news. There is some states that's putting the Ten Commandments back in schools. One state, I don't remember which one it is, is putting the Bible, putting the Bible back in schools and having the teachers to teach the history of the Bible and how this country was founded on God's Word. That's a start. That is a start to correct the wrong. That's been, uh, that's been what was done by taking God out of schools. You know, we have witnessed, we have witnessed firsthand what happens when God is taken out. We need to keep praying, keep praying for our country because you know these states that's doing this, they're going to be sued and taken to court. So we need to keep praying for them. Verse 15, now my eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. So God makes a promise that if they repent and turn to him, he would hear them, see them, and forgive them, bless them, and meet their needs. God will do the exact same thing for us today. In verse 16, For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever. And my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. God, has cho God had chosen to dwell in the temple. And he had chosen the Israelites to be his people. For them to know God's name. You know, that was just like it was, had a relationship with God. God's name will be there forever. No matter how many times people try to take God's name out. You know, all through history, if you look through his, history, people have tried to take away or do away with God's word. Satan tries. He tries, but he's going to fail. God and his word is forever.
Okay, uh, I'll read this, uh, verse 17. And it's for thee, if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, and do according to all that have commanded thee, and shall observe my statutes and, ju and my judgments. You know, God promised, he promised to bless the Israelites, but it was conditional on if they were obedient. God in this verse is talking to Solomon. Israel, Israel's king would receive blessings from God, but he had to remain faithful. It says, if thou wilt walk, with, walk before me, this is meaning his lifestyle was to obey God. You know, the king would be held accountable to God on how he lived, but also how he ruled. Solomon was... Solomon was to rule like, uh, it, it, like David, his father. It says David was a man after God's heart. You know, David was a good man, a good king, but David was not perfect. We know that David committed adultery and, and also murder, but David sought after God's forgiveness. David had messed up. Man, he messed up, and he had sinned just like all of us mess up and sin. The key point here is David turned from his sin and repented, and God forgave him for his sins. God blessed David, and he became a great king. Couldn't build the temple. Solomon had to do that, but, but God still is the same God today. We all sin. We all need to repent. Turn to Jesus and he will forgive us. It's just, it's just that simple. It's that simple. I'll go to um, the last verse because we're going around time. Then will I pluck them up by the roots out of the land which I given, have given them. In this house which I have sanctified for my name. Will I cast out of my sight and will make it to, to be a proverb and a byword among the nations. The temple was probably a sight to see. But if people did not remain faithful to God, God would abandon the temple and it and would end up being destroyed. God says he would make them to be a proverb and, or a byword among the nations. God promised that if they broke the covenant, God would make them an example to all the other nations to see the consequences of of not keeping the covenant with him. You know, God has blessed America, as I said, because we were founded on God, but our country keeps turning away from God. Here, God in this lesson has given us the blueprint on how we can correct all the wrongs that has been taking place across our country. As I said, it's simple Repent. Turn back to God, and God will bless us. As Kurt says every Sunday, we need to keep praying for our country.